Good morning, EAC Church family. This beautiful Sunday, Lord's Day. It's great to see you all here. We've come here because he is risen. We have a God who cared enough about us that he sent his son to provide a sacrifice for us, to forgive us from our sins, that we can spend eternity in relationship with him. And that is something so special that we can look forward to. Please stand as we sing about that grace, for God so loved the world.
you pray with me? God, I thank you for this gathering this morning. I believe you've been at work, that you are working, and that you have more to do. And so I pray that we would be attentive to what you are wanting to do among us. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Some of us come with heavy hearts this morning. Some of us come energized. Some of us come ready to learn. Some of us come feeling like we barely made it here. And yet, Lord, we believe you know each one of our hearts, each one of our minds. Would you give people what they need this morning? Would we hear from you? And Lord, we want to acknowledge something beyond our own worlds this morning as the situation seems to have escalated in Israel, Lord, we don't always know how to pray, but we pray for safety for individuals who are there. We pray that you would do a work there that is clearly you. We pray for peace. We pray for protection. And we pray uh, for goodness to thrive in a dark environment, in a dark place at this point in history. And so for uh, our gathering this morning, the next 30 minutes or so minutes, Lord, would you move among us, do things that only you could get the credit for, and it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray, amen, amen. Well, hello, and if you are new, uh, welcome. My name is Connor Nigenfind. I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Edgewater Alliance, and I think you picked a good day to join us because I think you're in for a blessing this morning. Uh, some of you were likely here yesterday for our mini conference we did with Brad Nelson, yeah, with Walking the Text. It was a good day, and so we're trying to do these kind of mini conferences here at EAC twice a year, so be on the lookout if you missed this one for the next one, um, but we have uh, our guest speaker this morning, Brad Nelson from Walking the Text, which is an organization that helps people understand the Bible in its original context, and I had the privilege of going along with Travis and Stacey Mack and my wife to Israel in 2022, and Brad helped facilitate that trip, and I got to know him on a personal level, and not only do I appreciate his mind and what he has to say, I appreciate his heart and his friendship. And as I've said before, one of the cool things about my job is I get to bring people that I love and want to learn from to the church that I love and have us hopefully learn collectively. And so Brad has been a pastor for 17 years before becoming the content director at Walking the Text. Walking the Text is working right now on a pretty remarkable endeavor to create a TV show uh, that I think is gonna be produced by Mark Burnett, which is the guy who's like produced Survivor, I think like The Voice. Like it's gonna be, I think, a pretty uh, remarkable endeavor, but it's all about ex exposing people to biblical content in its original context. And Brad Nelson is gonna be working on the book that is gonna come out alongside of of that TV show, and hopefully, I'm hoping, 
that um, when the situation in Israel calms down, Lord willing, that we'll be able to take a group of people from EAC off for a trip and go with Brad Nelson to go explore the Holy Land together. But I think you're in for a blessing this morning. And so EAC, would you please give a warm welcome to my friend, Brad Nelson. Hello? There we go. It was my fault. I'm just getting ready to go home and be with my family. It was my fault. What do you know? Oh, well, hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Brad, and uh, if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, and while you're turning there, I want to begin by telling you a story about Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was walking home one evening from the synagogue. And like rabbis do, as he was walking along the road, he was reciting the Torah aloud from memory. And as he walked, he got so engrossed and so enthralled and so involved in his recitation that he didn't notice when he came to a fork in the road, and in the dark, he took the wrong path. So that instead of walking in the direction of his home, he walked in the direction of a Roman military fortress. And the rabbis walking along in the dark, reciting the Torah aloud, when out of the darkness, he hears this big booming voice that says, who are you? What are you doing here? And the rabbi was kind of dumbfounded, took him a minute to get his wits about him, and the voice came again. Who are you? What are you doing here? And now he had his wits about him, and in true rabbinic fashion, he answered the question with a question. How much do they pay you, centurion, to guard that wall? The Roman was not prepared for this, And he said, one denarius, what's that to you, Jew? And the rabbi answered, I will pay you twice that to sit outside the door of my home and ask me those two questions every day when I wake up and I leave my house. Who are you and what are you doing here? Because friends, when you know who you are and you know why you're here, you will walk and live with greater power and greater influence in the world. And Paul, in the letter to the the church at Ephesus, the Ephesians, he is going to lay out this case for what it looks like to grow up in Jesus, how to become a mature follower of Jesus. And when you look at Paul's letters in the New Testament, generally, He's writing to churches who are in some kind of chaos or conflict. And he's having to help them think through, like, how do we get out of this mess that we've got ourselves into? How do we live appropriately? But he's not doing that in Ephesians. In Ephesians, Paul is simply telling this group of people, hey, here's how to grow up in Jesus. If you want to mature in the way of Jesus and become like him, Here's how you do it. Now, as we move in to kind of the way Paul has structured this letter, I just want to show you this 3D reconstruction of the city of Ephesus during the first century. So this is what the city would have looked like coming in off of the port. It was a port city at the time, and so it was the fourth largest city in the Roman world, probably had 250,000 people. This theater is where a riot almost broke out in the book of Acts chapter 19. 
Paul had made so much inroads into the community, leading people to Jesus, that it was having an impact on the sale of Artemis idols. And the workers in town were not happy about this. These are what the villas would have looked like on the mountainside. If you remember when the early church began, they didn't meet in church buildings. They met in people's homes as house churches. And so they would have gathered together in homes like this. But as you see these photos, do you get a sense that this is a wealthy city? <laughs> this is a place of influence, of power. It was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the temple of Artemis, which you see here. It was a center of slave trade, a center of banking, a center of medicine. This was a cultural, iconic city. And what Paul is going to do as he talks to these people about growing up in Jesus is he's going to spend the first three chapters talking about their call to follow Jesus. In other words, he's going to spend three chapters saying to them, this is who you are, this is who you are, this is who you are. When I was a young pastor at a church in Michigan, we used to do baby dedications, and you've seen these. I know you. I, one of the times that I visited here and spoke, there were baby dedications happening. And typically what we would do back then is we would ask the parents to write a letter of commitment to their children, and then they would read this letter aloud to their children in front of their family and friends as a way to say, I commit to raising you in the way of Jesus, and then inviting their family and friends, hey, hold us accountable to this commitment that we've made. And normally, this, these letters were really sweet, but clearly, it's a baby. It can't understand what's being said. It just sits there quietly, or in some cases, not so quietly. And, um, but this particular baby dedication, it was a couple who was in their mid-40s, and they'd just become followers of Jesus. And their kids were 10 and 8. So when the moment came for the mom and dad to read their letter of commitment, the kids could understand what was being said. And I will not forget this dad reading this letter, and his 10-year-old son is sitting on a chair in front of him about five feet away. And the dad is just saying things like, buddy, I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. I see God in you in this way, in this way, in this way. And the dad's starting to get choked up. And the little boy is like white knuckling his seat, you know, leaning forward, hanging on every word. And the dad continues and just finally emotionally breaks. He can't keep reading and he hands the letter off to his mom and tears start to come and the little boy just erupts out of his chair and they bear hug in front of the room. It was so beautiful. And I tell you that story, friends, because that's what Paul is doing in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. He's saying, this is who you are in Jesus. This is who you are. This is who you are. This is who you are. It's like he can't wait to tell you about just how beautiful and good you are in Jesus. In fact, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14 is a 201 word run on sentence. <laughs> One Greek scholar just says simply, it is the most monstrous conglomeration of a Greek sentence that I have ever encountered. I mean, it's like Paul just is waiting to pull the string and just rip to tell you who you are in Christ. And he doesn't mention a single command about how you ought to behave until Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, 9. But when Paul gets to Ephesians 4, now he's going to shift gears and he's not going to talk about your identity, but he's going to talk about your behavior. But the way he does it is absolutely brilliant. What Paul does is he has a single word that he organizes this section around. In the, it's the word parapeteo. Let me hear you say parapeteo. It means to walk or to live. So some of your Bibles will say the word walk. Some of your Bibles will translate it as the word live, but it means the same thing. This is how you are to walk. But as Paul does that, what he does between these two chapters is he chooses six examples 
from the Roman street. So if you were walking down the street of a Greco-Roman city, he's identifying the bathhouse, the theater, the pub, and he's giving you all of these examples to say, here's what I mean when I say, walk like Jesus. And then, when you know who you are and you behave like Jesus, prepare yourself because trouble's coming. Because evil will not stand for people following in the way of Jesus without putting up a fight. And so he finishes the book by talking about conflict. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 24, he's gonna talk about the armor of God. How to prepare yourself for the trouble that's coming. Did you know you were intended by God to be a holy troublemaker? Some of you are like, yes, I always knew that about myself. So what I want to do this morning is just focus on one of those images from verse 1, where he writes this, be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Children. Now, when we read those words, it's not immediately clear to us what Paul's talking about from the Roman street. But friends, he's talking about the theater. At the heart of pretty much every Greco-Roman town was a theater. In fact, you just saw the one that I mentioned from Acts 19 where a riot almost broke out. That theater seats 25,000 people. It was at the center of Ephesus. And every Greco-Roman town had one of these. And if you went to the theater in the first century, as most people did, you could see four kinds of shows. The first one would just be a tragedy. So if you can picture a movie that you've seen, or maybe you've gone to see a play, and it's like Shakespeare, and it's very formal, that's a tragedy, right? Then you've got comedies. Picture your favorite rom-com, okay? Those are your comedies. But around the first century, the time Paul is writing, there are two kinds of theater that become really popular. One is called pantomime. And this is a single actor who's wearing a mask, and they're playing out an entire play just as a single person. And it was really impressive. It was, you had to be a virtuoso actor to pull this off, and it was fairly mesmerizing. But then pantomime <clears throat> morphed into the fourth kind of show that you could see at the theater, which was called mime. And mime included multiple actors, they didn't wear masks, and it also included dialogue, and this was the most popular kind of show in the first century, and do you know why? because it was incredibly lowbrow, outrageously explicit, highly sexual, in a way that was taking Greco-Roman sexual norms and values and introducing them into the culture in order to normalize them among the people. And this play was called The Mime. And when Paul says, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, friends, guess what the word imitate is in Greek? It is the word mimetes. Let me hear you say mimetes. mimetes. It's where we get mimic. It's where we get mime. Think about all of the movie quotes that you have seen that have passed from the movie world and into your regular everyday usage in life. So I had way too much fun prepping this, uh, but I wanna do a little experiment. I want to show you a series of pictures and I want you to call out to me what the movie is and what the quote is. And we'll just test your cultural IQ here. All right, so this, is, this first one is one that shows up a lot. It gets quoted a lot in everyday living in our home with three children, two of them teenagers. So let's start here. Doggone it, I went too fast. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. All right, yes. Tom Hanks, Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem. We'll dip back into the 90s here real quick. How about this one? 
Terminator, I'll be back. I still will pull that one out on the kids, but they don't get it anymore, so it's not quite as funny. Um, here's another one that features prominently in our home. See if you know this one. You can handle the truth, okay? All right. Um, this one is a little more recent, but uh, I find myself saying it quite a bit. So let's see your Will Ferrell knowledge. Glass case of emotion. That's right. All right. How about this one? Show me the money. Okay. Guys, we could keep going. And that's not unintentional. Because the folks who are writing this content are about something. They're trying to take ideas, get them into you, so that those ideas and values will get in you and they will then come out through you. When Alexander the Great conquered most of the known world in the third century BC, one of the problems that he had all of the sudden was, I have all these people who are a part of my empire and they're not Greek. They don't share my values. So how can I get them to operate with the same kind of worldview that I have? And one of the most successful things that Alexander the Great did was to build theaters in every city where he conquered. And what the shows did is they put this Greek thought, Greek values, Greek sexual practices into the theater in order to normalize so that people would take on those things. Eugene Peterson says this, the Greeks were not content with conquering militarily. They were crusaders for a way of life marked by intelligence and beauty and pleasure. They were aggressive, persistent, passionate, persuasive, and highly successful. Um, there is one author, Neil Postman, years ago, wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death and talked about how we live in a culture that is amusing itself to death. And in the book, he said basically this, if you want to conquer a people, don't make them afraid, give them pleasure. Because if you give them pleasure, then they will willingly enslave themselves to your system of thought. Friends, this is the world that we live in, is it not? And here's the idea behind the theater. The idea behind the theater is if we can get them to laugh at it, then we can get them to mimic it. If we can get them to mimic it, we can get them to adopt it. The theater, the Roman street, basically was entertaining people into a new education into a new worldview, into a new system of values, and friends, in thousands of years, things have not changed. In 2021, Americans alone streamed 15 million years of content on these platforms. How do you think that is shaping us. So Paul says, be imitators of God, not Hollywood. Um, a pastor and author who I follow and really enjoy is a guy by the name of John Mark Comer. And he released this book about four or five months ago called Practicing the Way. Be with Jesus, become like him, do as he did. It's one of the best books I've read in a long time. If you are a reader, I'd highly recommend getting a copy of this. But one of the statistics that he quotes in this book from the Barna Group was done in 2023. And it discovered that even in this moment in culture, in American culture, where we keep reading news stories about people who are leaving the church and walking away from their faith, even in this cultural moment, 
63% of Americans still claim to believe in Jesus. But when you ask that same 63% of people, and so how do you live your life differently on a daily basis because of that belief in Jesus? The 63 turns into 4%. And John Mark Homer just goes on to say, we have a crisis of discipleship. We have a crisis of people saying they believe in Jesus, but then not learning to follow him, not reorienting their life around becoming like him. And we talk often about discipleship. And so in Luke chapter six, we read something like this, a student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Now, this word training, it's the Greek word katartizo, and it means to train or to qualify fully. Now, that feels a little more like athletics, doesn't it? The early Christians thought of themselves as athletes who were in training for life. But when we talk about discipleship and we think of students and teachers, where does your mind go? I don't know about you, mine goes here. The problem is Jesus didn't stand at the front of a classroom with a flannel graph. His disciples didn't sit at desks shooting spitballs at each other. Jesus was an itinerant rabbi. Jesus taught on the go. He would walk, he would teach, they would follow him, they would watch what he did, and then they would do what they had watched him do. It's almost something a little more like this. <laughs> if you search dirty jobs, the description you will find online is that Micro says, I go to a place and I apprentice myself to someone. I simply watch what they do and then I do what I have seen them do. Now, my father, he's a pastor now, but when I was a kid, he was a master plumber. And so I grew up with apprentices in our home, people who were apprenticed to my father. They would come to the house early in the morning. They would load up the van with all the plumbing supplies. And I won't forget these early mornings where I'm getting ready for school and there's a group of apprentices in our kitchen having coffee, laughing, talking about the day, telling stories about yesterday. And often at the end of the day, they would come home, they would unload, sometimes they would stick around for dinner. And an apprentice wasn't just trying to learn the craft of plumbing, they were trying to learn the way my dad lived life the way my dad ran his business, the way my dad thought, the things that my dad valued. And to apprentice yourself to Jesus is the same thing. It is to watch him so that you can mimic and imitate what he does. And you see this play out with Jesus and his disciples. In Luke chapter five, he calls his disciples, and then four chapters later, after four chapters of walking around with these disciples, healing the sick, casting out demons, teaching the good news, then he says to his 12 closest disciples, okay, your turn. Now you go do this, and he sends them out. One chapter later, he's gonna send out a larger group of disciples, 72, and to do the same exact thing. And I want you to hear what happens when they come back from this mission. This is how it goes down. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned and have revealed them to who? To little 
children. Friends, what do little children do? They mimic. They imitate. Here you go. Okay, say bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> How many of you have seen this in your own home? You've got grandkids who do this. Yes, they imitate, they mimic what they see others do, and this can be a problem. Okay, but I have to yell at you guys. Okay, what? Like everything they do at this house, it can touch everything at grandma's house. Okay. Okay, then what? Then you're not listening to me. <laughs> then you're not listening to me. I asked you not to do something. <laughs> Apparently, this little guy's been listening in to some marital discord in the home and is just reenacting what he has seen. And this is how we are as humans. We mimic what we see. Now, I used to think that this was a sign of failure. When I was first learning to become a pastor and to preach, I was being mentored by the pastor at my church. And when I would go out somewhere and I would preach, I would get the recording, I would listen to it, and I thought, oh my gosh, I sound just like him. I have no voice of my own. I even inflect my voice in the same spots. I'm failing. Brothers and sisters, imitation is the beginning of maturity. It is the way children grow up and become who they are and find their voice. And for those of you who are seeking to grow up in Jesus, imitation is the beginning of maturity. The question is, are you going to imitate Jesus or are you going to imitate Hollywood? Because what is true about human beings is we become what we behold. And brothers and sisters, the stakes have never been higher. Because the theater is not in the center of town. We now carry it in our pockets. And it gets a lot of our time, and it gets a lot of our attention. And Paul says, know who you are. Know why you're here. Mimic Jesus. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Let's pray. Gracious God, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. And God, I, I, I reflect on this passage and what you did with your disciples, what you seem to be saying through Paul and It's convicting. It's really convicting, God. So much other than you gets my attention. So God, I pray that your spirit would have a unique level of permission to just run around inside our heads and hearts and knock things over and rearrange the furniture and call us back to you. God, for those of us who showed up here today and we're disrupted and we're stressed and we need comfort, God, I pray that your spirit would meet each of those people and that you would soothe them, that you would give them the comfort they need. But God, for the many of us, myself included, who show up here with a certain level of complacency, who've just fallen into the cultural streams 
that are just carrying life forward around us, that pull our attention towards a screen, towards a phone, towards some message that reflects a kingdom and values that aren't yours. I pray, God, that your spirit would woo us and allure us back to you. God, remind us of the truth of who we are, that we were made for something more. Give us this unique capacity to mimic and imitate your son so that we can become the kind of people that you made us to be. Spirit, we love you, we thank you, we bless you for your love for us, for your care for us. We ask that you would lead and guide us now out of this place, out of this gathered body of people and back into our world with new eyes, capable of seeing that right there alongside of all of these cultural streams is your kingdom and that you're present and that you're doing something and that your kingdom is advancing, and that if we have eyes to see and feet willing to follow, that we can be a part of it. God, turn us into imitators of your son, Jesus. We ask all of this in the strong, resurrected name of him. Amen. All right, go in peace and have a great week. Mm -hmm.